morning, City Church. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dennis. I know Dennis is awake. Good morning. Good morning to those online and welcome. We're so glad, so glad you guys are, are choosing to join us either in person or online and, and so thankful that we have the opportunity to, to be able to be here together as well as connect with, uh, connect with our church body Hallelujah. remotely, right? So before we get uh, too formal into everything here, I want to say a huge thank you to, I know a bunch of people, both guys and gals in this room and those that may not even Maybe feeling a little sore this morning, having trouble, having trouble getting together. But yeah, it's a lot of work. I, I'm sure I won't take um, I won't take Pastor Chris's thunder. I'm sure he has a lot of fun things to comment on from yesterday um, at the uh, at the Anderson campus, the Foursquare Church in Anderson, getting completely refreshed, and it looked and smelled entirely better by the time we all left yesterday. So it's amazing paint. And the smell of, um, if you like the smell of sawdust, there was a lot of that in the air, and it was really cool. It was a lot of progress and, and stuff going on. So thank you for all of you guys and gals. Like I said, there was, um, there was everybody chipping in, and, and, and a little bit more to do before we're able to get started down there um, on Easter. So is anyone joining us uh, here this morning in person for the first time? If so, and I don't want to, oh, thank you. Thank you for putting your hand up. We're going to have an usher come by and, and give you a... Oh, Pastor Chris already took care of it. <laughs> Anyone else? I don't want to miss anybody. Jocelyn over here. It's, it's easy for me to kind of like look at you if I know I don't know your face, so I don't try to do that. But thank you for raising your hand. We want to make sure we give you some information and have an opportunity for you to share, um, if you're willing, your contacts and things. If you're online as well, um, please go to citychurchreading.org. That's right, yeah, citychurchreading.org, and uh, fill out an information uh, information card and submit that so we can make sure we get uh, get some information to you as well. So would you guys stand with me this morning? So if you're a regular or whether you're a newcomer, just um, we, we love to highlight the things that, that we look forward to on Sundays. And, and for us, that's corporate worship, that's drawing together, um, praising the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord. Um, being open to his Holy Spirit moving amongst us, amen? amen? And we love our children, and so we are so blessed and so thankful that we are, at least in a modified way, able to start reaching our kids again. So if you're with us and we have kids, you have kids here, um, after worship, um, you'll be prompted, I believe, at least to, uh, to go ahead and release your kids. Most kids actually get signed in, I think, when they first get here, and then you'll be able to, uh, to usher them off to Children's Church, so. Let's, uh, let's join our hearts together in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you that, Jesus, that you are our sustainer. Um, you, are, you are all that we need, Lord God. We thank you that you, we are able to draw together this morning, Lord Jesus, that we are able to um, open ourselves in worship to you. And God, that you are, are so ready to meet us. And Jesus, I pray that you would knit our hearts together this morning, Lord God, that our ears would be open to the message being spoken. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm giddy with excitement to see everybody out here because everyone's so joyful and um, that makes me happy, especially because like most of you were there at the church yesterday and I just thought for the size of our church and how many people showed up for that work day, that was absolutely the most awesome thing ever. I just, I don't know, I just love you guys and I feel very happy that I get to worship God with you. <laughs> So, and it's funny because like off and on through my life, I've been a worship leader and for some, I don't know if it's like the rebel in me, but I never like being told what to do when I worship. Okay, everybody stand. Well, what if I don't want to stand? I just want to say whatever you feel like you need to do to truly worship God, whatever that looks like, if it's sitting, if it's getting on your knees or standing up and shouting, like I want you to feel free to do that. Like just worship God. Just sing to him. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, the feet may There I find you in 
my God. The feed me fail and fear surrounds me. You've never failed and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. The notions rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, you are mine. Oh, oh, oh. And you are. Praise hallelujah, yes. I like that. So 
for the work that you are doing in our hearts. God, we want to magnify you, God. We want to glorify you. God, we want to, for you to shine, God, through us. Thank you, God. We thank you, God, that our hearts and our ears are tuned to you right now, God. God, that you are speaking, God, and our hearts are, and our ears are ever attuned to you, God. We thank you, God, for comforting those who need comfort, God, for healing the brokenhearted, God. God, for meeting with that person in their, in their joy, God. You are the giver of joy. so much for what you're doing. Amen. Amen. Before you, hey, before you're seated, I'm going to push against your rebellion one little bit. Uh, let's just give the Lord one more shout of praise. Jesus, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Mighty are you, Lord. Amen. Now you may be seated. If you'd like, far be it for me to tell him what to do, Kathy. Um, I feel bossy. Oh, it's good to see you, church. Whew. Okay. Well, God is so good to us. Um, if you're here this morning and you would like to... Um, give tithes or offering today. We're not really passing the plate as of yet because of whatever's been going on. So um, you can stop by the hub afterwards and you can do that at the uh, little counters back there that we call the hub. And if you're watching online, we have different ways for you to participate in giving. We have online giving and text to give and all those neat things. So you can, you can participate like that. How you doing this morning, church? I got to tell you, you sound good today. Worship team, you sounded okay. But congregation, sounded good. No, I'm just kidding. You guys rocked. You would have rocked a little more with some lead guitar. I got to tell you, it was hard for me not to grab my guitar. It was like, oh, man, I want to jam with this. But it was still good to worship. You guys sounded awesome congregation you sounded awesome this morning so good to praise the lord so yeah we had a work day yesterday at the new campus down in anderson big time work day i tell you what kathy mentioned it this morning when she said you know for a church our size you know to put out that type of representation you guys do a work day like you're a church of 500 you know so i'm telling you it was i okay so I'm so excited about the new church down there. I'm, ex I'm so excited that we get to bring something like this, like what we do here to the community of Anderson, that we get to bless them. 
and um, for the lives that are going to be restored there, the people who are going to be drawn close to God, the new relationships that we're going to make there, it's going to be fantastic. But on top of that, I got to tell you, I was so, and I hope this is okay to say, I was so proud of you guys yesterday. I mean, what was going on down there was amazing from just the level of cleaning and hauling stuff away and then the construction and not just casual construction but like deep construction that I don't really try you know where floors are being ripped up and like the wood's gone and it's being replaced you know and just electrical work and everything it was just awesome and um yesterday I don't know how many of you saw him while he was walking around but our district administrator Elias Abdullah he came and visited the church and he brought a couple of young guys with them they were planning on working and um i gotta tell you when he got there he was absolutely blown away by what he saw he said um he said chris we never see something like this when we go to a site like this to to fix it up and try to get it going again he said usually i'll show up with a couple of guys and it's like me my two guys and the pastor or something, you know? And he said, we show up here and you guys got an army over here doing this stuff. So it was just so cool. You know, as we were walking around, he's looking at all the work that's being done and, uh, you know, sheetrock and walls and floors and sound booths and electrical stuff and everything that's going on. And um, I hear him start asking about money, right? And, um, and I said, if you're worried about the budget, we haven't even touched the district money yet that they gave to us. I said, this is all stuff that our church council has bought with, you know, lumber and sheetrock. And then I said, a lot of this stuff has been purchased by people doing the work too. So I said, we haven't even touched it. He said, oh no, I'm not worried about it. He said, I'm thinking we need to get you some more, right? So, um, you know, I think he just, he sees how our church is digging in, the stewardship that's happening there, and they're excited about it. They're excited about what God's going to do there. So, super proud of you, church. It's just, it's amazing what's happening, and it is going to be a blessing to that community. You guys ready to get into the Word today? Okay, so we've taken a break from Revelation for a couple of weeks, but we're going to be back in it. And just to kind of frame this, and this was just things I was thinking about this morning, but concerning the book of Revelation, I don't think there is, I don't think there is any more of a misunderstood or neglected book in all of Scripture. And I was just thinking about like more modern church history and Again, this isn't these aren't things right now that I'm sharing with you that are that are super studied out. It was just some observations I was thinking about. But um, in the 1500s, you have what we refer to as the Great Reformation, right? This is with Martin Luther's 95 thesis and and he begins to usher in a new type of thinking, a biblical type of thinking, Bible-based Christianity that says we are saved by grace and not by works. And he nails that 95 thesis to the door, and the Great Reformation starts for the Protestant church, the Protestant church coming out of Catholicism. So this was a huge step forward in the church. And yet, early on, in Protestant theology, even Martin Luther himself, even his theology, it was far from perfect, right? Because there was a great awakening taking place and people were just coming alive to being able to study the scripture. People were just getting access to the Bible because of the printing press, right? So all of these things are new and it was a huge step forward, but it really began a process of theology getting better and better and better and better, right? Now, if you look back at all of the great Protestant preachers and the teaching from the Reformation, 
the book of Revelation is almost absent from their teaching, right? Because it just didn't make sense. So for a long time, it goes neglected. It's not being looked at. And then we had an event in the um, 1940s, right, that all of a sudden made people snap to and start paying attention to all of this. And that was Israel became a nation again. And for younger people right now, for I think about the teenagers in the room or even people in their 20s or 30s, even people possibly my age, it's hard to comprehend how huge that was. You take it for granted now when you read about the promises to Israel that you have a current nation to point to and say, and yes, we can see that taking place in Israel. We can see how Israel is blessed. We can see God's promises to them. Up until 1948, that nation did not exist. So think about the, the dilemma that people were in as they're studying the Bible and they're looking, about prof, they're looking at prophecies about Israel and, and all of the things that's going to happen relative to that nation, but it's a nation that still did not exist. So obviously the theology born out of that time concerning it and concerning end times is going to be broken, right? But then in the 1940s, Israel becomes a nation again. People start to rethink all of this. Eschatology, the study of end times, becomes a thing again. And people start digging into the book of Revelation. But we kind of started the growing curve over again. In the same way, like the, Rev the Reformation was a huge start, right? And, but people initially, they were still getting things wrong, and, but it got better and better and better and better until doctrines of salvation and, you know, in the early 1900s with the spirit-filled revivals, doctrines on the Holy Spirit, all of those things were getting better and better. But then do you see how like in the 1940s, that kind of restarted that learning process concerning eschatology again. So then in the 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of people start teaching on the book of Revelations and the rapture and, and um, things, prophecies concerning Israel. But it's all new again, and they're getting it wrong. A lot of it is wrong. I mean, you've heard me joke around about movies like A Thief in the Night, and when I was a kid, they would show it to us. And that movie was made way before even I was born, right? So, you know, but they're showing this movie, Thief in the Night, and you're like seven years old, and you're just seeing gu guillotines and people being marked and all this stuff, and you're like, what is going on, right? And the book of Revelation was just this terror story about the Antichrist. Well, I joke around about that, except for the fact that the theology of that movie, in large part, is not that good, right? And it's okay because, again, it's just, it was on that growing curve. But later on in the 80s and the 90s, you end up with these powerful theologians. Some you might not have even heard of. My favorite is a guy named Hilton Sutton. And he wrote this book called Revelation Revealed. If you ever just want to read like an authoritative, awesome book on, on the book of Revelation, read Revelation Revealed by Hilton Sutton. So... You know, in the 80s and 90s, even though there was still a lot of weird stuff going on, there started to really become this, this great leap forward in theology concerning these things. But then it's like in the 2000s, the church kind of, especially the church in America, sort of made this, this bad veering off a little bit into really focusing on ourselves. This kind of meism, consumerism type word that was being preached that's really just all about you being happy and doing whatever, you know, you're passionate about and all this stuff, right? And it really, you know, just kind of became this consumeristic gospel. And it's like right on the cusp of receiving some really solid, wonderful theology about the book of Revelation, the church kind of veered off into narcissism. And definitely the book of Revelation has no place for that because it's about Jesus Christ. 
It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So still, this book remains largely misunderstood and neglected. So when you talk to people about Revelation, like even as I've been doing this study, honestly, one of the biggest misnomers about it or misunderstood things is about this thing referred to as the mark of the beast. So we're going to look at Revelation 13, but we're going to pull in a few things this morning, and we're going we're to kind of dissect the reality of what this is. Now, I'll be honest with you. Um, I like to teach through Revelation, but there are people and, you know, theologians who are, are better at this than me. But what I believe is what I will give you today is accurate, right? My, my favorite line in a movie, or one of my favorite lines in a movie, is from an old Western called Shane. Has anybody seen Shane? Okay, with Alan Ladd, right? Everyone over 50 is like, yeah! <laughs> no, if you haven't seen Shane, watch the movie Shane. It has the best bar fight of any movie in history, right? Like where Alan, it's not just this stupid stuff. Like Alan Ladd squares up, he's jabbing. I mean, it's so good, right? So it's the classic story. This guy wants to hang up his guns, but, you know, He's working on a family farm. At the, you know, the big bullies are trying to take everyone's land, right? So finally he has to put the guns back on. So, you know, it's like, it's classic. So anyways, this little kid wants him to show him how to shoot. And, uh, and he puts on his gun, and the kid goes, um, so-and-so uses two guns, and he's all, well, that's because so-and-so needs two guns, right? But that's not the line. He's all, he's all, the way I'm going to show you is as good as any and better than most, right? And I've always thought about that. That is such an awesome line, right? Not like, the, not like teaching the word is the equivalent of gunslinging, okay? It's not. But what I'm going to show you today I believe is as good as any and probably better than most of what you hear. And I don't say that arrogantly. I say it because good people have sown good things into my life. And it is so exciting when the opportunity comes to be able to share some of these things from the Word. Amen? Okay, so Revelation 13 uh, we're going we're gonna to get into a little bit this fear about the mark of the beast by Christians, which I believe today is unfounded and not grounded in faith. Revelation 13, verse 1. I'm sorry, I don't have scriptures for you today because I've just been a little busy this week to make PowerPoint slides. So, um, you know, you can either just let me read it for you or you can try to follow along on your phones or your Bibles or whatever you got to search the scriptures with. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his ten horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power. This is the same dragon back at Christmas time. We looked at Revelation chapter 12, how the dragon was seeking to devour the child that the virgin would give birth to. And we saw how that was a look back at a satanic attack on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That same dragon now is giving power to the beast. It says, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, 
And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? So what is the beast? Fortunately, we don't really have to wonder that much about that because this is a fulfillment of prophecy that was given to the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. So if we look back at Daniel chapter 7, there is a, there is a vision that Daniel receives, and he sees four beasts. And each of those four beasts represent a kingdom. And I think the first kingdom was actually the one, the kingdom that Daniel was in at the time, which was Babylon, right? And the next one would have been, I believe, Greece. And then the next one was Rome. And then the fourth kingdom is this one that is, that is being talked about here in the book of Revelation. Four beasts, three of them global kingdoms that in our time now have already taken place, and the fourth one is one that is to come. Now, if we read um, a description of this fourth beast, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, it says, and remember, this is back in the Old Testament now, it says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth. Iron is significant. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns, right? So we see this the correlation between this beast des described in Revelation and the one described in Daniel. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, the little one coming up among them. This is the Antichrist. And before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay? So that is a description of the Antichrist as being the dominant figure in this beast the beast, right? So then after that, in verse 9 of Daniel chapter 7, it says, I watched till all the thrones were put in place. This beast is revealed. But then ultimately, who comes after that? The true king of kings and lord of lords. Because it says, and the ancient of days was seated, and his garment was white as snow. So if you can, think back to the description of, that John gives when he sees Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, and now consider this vision that Daniel received back in Daniel chapter 7. Okay? So it says, And the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure like wool, and his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the court was seated, and the books were opened. And think about what we've read already in the book of Revelation about the, the revelation of the judgment of God, which we refer to as the Great Tribulation. That's how we know it in the Bible the seven-year tribulation. And how was that revealed? A scroll was presented to Jesus that he was only found worthy to open. So Daniel sees the revelation of this beast, right, on earth, but then he sees Jesus, the one that before him all the books were opened. Okay? So we see them tying together. Now, exactly what is the beast? We've got a pretty good picture of it so far. But in verse 23 of Daniel 7, he gives an interpretation of it. I love that. Sometimes scripture just gives you the, the right thing. Like when Jesus gives the parable of the sower, and everybody's like, what does that mean? But then Jesus pulls his disciples aside, and he takes all the guesswork out of it. And he totally explains it in depth, right? I love it when we don't have to speculate at all. Well, Daniel 7:23 says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. 
and shall devour the whole earth and trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them and he shall be different from the first one and he shall subdue all three kings or shall subdue three kings and he shall speak pompous words against the most high. So the beast in Revelation is a revised version of these um, of these empires combined and headed up by the Antichrist. How do we know that? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. You remember that story where he sees this giant statue and it's made of different materials. I didn't I didn't pull it up here to remember exactly, but it's like it's like gold, bronze, and iron, right? And then the feet though, the feet are made of a mixture like the toes are a mixture of iron and clay, okay? So it represents different kingdoms, and that final kingdom represented at the feet is that final kingdom that we are seeing here described as the beast. So each of the previous kingdoms were described by a different element, right? Iron being representative of Rome, Okay, so Rome was the Iron Empire. Okay, they were, that was what they were known as. So they were the fulfillment of the iron part. But the feet, ten toes, like ten horns, right? The ten toes were a mixture of iron and clay, showing that that final kingdom is going to be like a revised Roman Empire that has pulled other nations, other kingdoms into it. Okay, headed up. By the Antichrist. Does that make sense? And then also in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, he saw then a big stone, a big rock, which was Jesus, right? Roll down and take all of those kingdoms out at the feet and just destroy them all, which is what will happen at the actual second coming of Jesus at the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns to this earth. He takes out all of those earthly kingdoms, and he rules and reigns on this earth for 1,000 years, the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, okay? So that is the beast in its description, some kind of revised Roman empire that is going to attempt to dominate the world, being headed up by the Antichrist, but will ultimately be thwarted by Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, the Ancient of Days. Amen. I feel like that deserves an amen. So, the beast in Revelation, okay, I told you that, 10 mixed toes. Skipping, skipping, skipping. Okay, Revelation, like it's my iPad. It's just paper. Okay, so Revelation 13, Verse 5. Let's get back to that and look now at more of a description about this beast. It says, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 40, 42 months. Okay? It's very specific there. So what we know is that what is taking place in Revelation 13 here is the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. 42 months being what? Three and a half years, right? Three and a half years. So at this point, the beast, halfway through the tribulation, has finally come to power. It was a struggle. We know from Daniel that during the first three and a half years, right, because the Antichrist was revealed in Revelation chapter 6, and power was given to them over a fourth part of the earth, okay? And we know that that three and a half years was a struggle because Daniel 7 tells us that he had to subdue three other kings in order to establish his kingdom. So now three and a half years into it, he finally has the ten-horned kingdom established, and the the dragon gives him his assignment to do his worst now 
for three and a half years. We're three and a half years into it. We also know we're three and a half years into it because for the previous three and a half years, there has been two witnesses testifying in Jerusalem, right? And it says that power was given to them. And it's interesting when you hear the description of them, two that have never tasted death, and they have the power to shut up the heavens so it won't rain. And they have the power to bring all kinds of plagues upon the earth so that um, they can turn the water into blood. And when you read the description of what they do, it's quite possible that these two are actually Elijah and Moses, right? By description of miracle. In fact, I know there's something significant with those two because when Jesus stands on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, who appears and stands there with him? Elijah and Moses, right? So it's likely that in Jerusalem, these two witnesses that have been prophesying for the first 42 months are doing the exact same things. It's possible they were Elijah and Moses. We don't know that for sure, but it's possible. But what we know is their ministry went three and a half years, and then they were killed, right? And then they were dead for three days, but then they rose, and then they get caught up into heaven, and now the, the full um, operation of the beast takes place. Okay, so we are at the middle point of the tribulation. Agreed? All right, good. So now, picking it back up in verse 11 of Revelation 13, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This is the false prophet. Okay? And um, we'll get into what his origin at least is, if not his identity possibly in the coming weeks. That'll be a fun one. <laughs> I promise you people will be upset on that Sunday. So, anyways, but not today. We're, it's a happy day. We had a good church work day yesterday. Let's, let's not sour it with good doctrine. Verse 12. It says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that even he makes fires come down from heaven. Interesting how Satan is just a liar and a counterfeiter, right? The two witnesses have been doing this for three and a half years. Now, when they're taken out of the scene, Satan tries to emulate it. I'll call down fire from heaven, right? Just like with Moses' staff and the sorcerers try to copy it, right? Ultimately, we're going to see here that the mark of the beast is just another one of those cheap counterfeit lies. Spoiler alert. Verse 14, it says, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now listen to this. He causes all, midway through the tribulation, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So as I said, you know what I take away from all of this is that Satan is a fake, and he is a liar, and he is a thief, and he is a murderer. 
And I'll tell you why. Because at this point, he is doing everything he can to counterfeit the power of God. Revelation is a revelation of the power and person and nature of Jesus Christ. His power is on full display, and this is a desperate grasp by the enemy to emulate it. Let's keep in mind what's happened so far in Revelation. At this point, you've had the revelation of Jesus Christ. You've had the time of the church, which is chapters 2 and 3. Okay, this is... This is the area of the book. If you had to find, where do I fit in this story? You're right there in chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. Then in chapter 4, you have the rapture of the church. In chapter 5, you have Jesus being found worthy to open the scrolls, the scroll containing the judgment of God, which is the seven-year tribulation. Okay, Chapter 6, Jesus opens the first seal. The Antichrist is revealed as this white horseman, Obviously, another counterfeit because we know Jesus will return on a white horse, but Jesus fights with a sword. The devil fights with a bow, fiery darts, right? And that's what the Antichrist on his white horse had was a bow, okay? Plus, he's going for it to kill, you know? But anyways, so you have the beginning of that, and then what do you have? God still needs an evangelistic force to spread the good news throughout the world during that time because we know that the Holy Spirit is still present on the earth and that people will still be coming to Christ even after the rapture. So who is it that is going to spread the gospel? God seals 144,000 Jews and he marks them so that they will not be touched by his judgment. So now, here is Satan being thwarted and whooped by the power of God and by the evangelistic force of this 144,000 who have received a mark and somehow seem to be immune from everything else that's happening on the earth, right? And Satan comes up with his own counterfeit mark and says, then I will mark my people as well. And yet we always focus on his mark and how scary that is, and neglect the fact that God has been marking people for a long time. You think about the first time after Cain kills his brother Abel, and God banishes Cain, and Cain says, but anywhere I go, they're going to kill me and take revenge upon me, and what does God do? He puts a mark on Cain, and he says, from that mark, now Cain, nobody is going to touch you. There's this interesting story in Ezekiel, and I'll just read the, the briefest part of it here in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3. It says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. In verse 4, it says, The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. You see, God is wanting to cause a distinction between those who are actually lamenting over the sin and those who are committing the sin. And he does this by telling this angel, go through it and put a mark on them. Okay? And then it says, um, it says, to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. And do not let your eyes spare nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young and maidens and children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So God was marking people way back when. When he marks you, it's a mark that says, my judgment is going to pass over you. Think of when Israel was in slavery in Egypt, and it's time for them to be brought out in the 10th plague, right? The angel of death is coming. And what does he have them do? He has them slay a lamb and then mark their doorposts with blood. And then God says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
And isn't that just a type, as we know? Doesn't that just foreshadow the blood of Jesus marking our lives and the judgment of God passing over us? It's, it's disappointing to me sometimes when I hear Christians so concerned about the mark of the beast. Honestly, you hear it all the time whenever something new happens. I hear it right now with vaccinations, right? This is not the mark of the beast. It is not, and, and it wouldn't matter anyways, because if you've come to Jesus Christ, you've already been marked. You've already been marked. God has been marking his people for protection for years. There's nothing going to come against you that would escape the Lord. Jesus told us not to be afraid of someone who can destroy your body. He said to be afraid of the one who could destroy your body and throw your soul into hell. Right? I'm not afraid of the Antichrist or the mark of the beast. I much more want to live in the fear of the Lord. Much more. The Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet, 666, just a fake trinity, right? It's all fake. This number of six is just the incompleteness of anything that him or man could try to do to attempt God's glory. All of those things will just be another one of Satan's failed attempts to gain control over this earth through a single man. You think back in history, how many times, and I'm, I'm going to be done with this point here, but you think how many times in history that Satan has tried to do that, going back to the first Adam, who God had given Adam dominion over the earth, and then Satan targets him, because that is a dominion that Satan wanted, right? And it didn't work. But then he tries it again, doesn't he? He tries it with Nebuchadnezzar, this world empire. He tries it with Alexander the Great. He tries it with Caesar, right? He probably tried it with Hitler. He's probably tried it a number of times throughout history. And the Antichrist is just going to be another one of those failed attempts of him trying to raise up somebody that he can have dominion over the earth through. But it's not going to work because all dominion and all power and all glory have been given to Jesus Christ. The one who 1 Corinthians 15 recognizes as who? The second Adam. Do you see how it was all given to him because he undid the curse that came upon mankind through Adam? All dominion, all power, all glory belong to Jesus. And he has marked us with his precious blood. We have been washed, forgiven, and made citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We don't have to worry about some earthly satanic mark. As I said, we have been marked by the power and the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I would just tell you, if you're here today or if you're watching online, um, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, any of that other Mark stuff is a moot point, right? Because you have been sealed by the blood of Jesus. You have not only been sealed against the attacks of Satan, but can I tell you that you've also been sealed against the judgment of God. That's what it means to have the atoning blood of Jesus Christ over our lives. You think about instances of God's judgment. How has God judged? I know I said I'd be done, but I'm not. Genesis chapter 6, God judges the earth with a global flood, right? But he instructs Noah to build an ark. And when he builds that ark, he then tells him, now I want you, Noah, to pitch the ark within and without which means what? He would go through and seal all the cracks between the boards with pitch. It's the exact Hebrew word that everywhere else in the Bible is translated atonement. 
So when we have the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, you realize it's sealing us against the judgment. It is the mark of God on our life that is keeping out the waters and the flood of judgment that will come upon this earth. God gave us the promise, I will not pour my wrath out on my children. Right? So we have been sealed. We have been marked by the precious blood of Jesus. So as I said, if you are watching this and you have received Jesus as your Savior, or if you're sitting here this morning hearing this and you've received Christ as your Savior, you have been marked already. You have been sealed by the blood of Jesus. And if you have not, then you just need to receive Christ as your Savior. Ask him in your heart. Ask for the forgiveness of sins. And it's that simple. By grace, through faith, you will be saved. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your precious blood. We thank you, Lord, that it is greater than any weak, demonic mark that the enemy could come up with. Lord, and we just say as a church, Lord, even standing in the gap for the body of Christ, Lord, we repent of being more fearful of the enemy's things and not being more respectful and honoring of what you've already done, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray for anyone who might be hearing these words now, if they don't know you as their Savior, that even now, Jesus, they would just invite you into their heart, that they would repent of their sins, and that, Lord, they would be washed and cleansed and sealed and even marked by your precious blood, Lord. I pray now, Lord, that for anybody in that, in that situation, that, Lord, it would not be an empty experience, but, God, they would feel the weight lifted off of them. Like in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, where he finally climbed that hill and he was carrying that heavy load, and he got to the cross and it just fell off his back and tumbled down the hill. And his name was changed to Christian. It went from Pilgrim to Christian. Lord, I pray, God, for anybody here or anybody watching this, that if they come to you at this time, Jesus, that they would feel that burden of sin, the old man, just fall away, Lord. Like the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he goes on to say, There is therefore now no condemnation, to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Lord, would this be a turning point, even for all of us, Lord, to just recommit to seeking you, Jesus, to serving you, Lord, to not giving ear to, to fables, Lord, and myths and all those things, but to really just keeping our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, running the race that is set before us. I thank you for this, Lord. I pray, God, again, for your great salvation, Lord, to be poured out on those who don't know it, that they would receive you, Lord, as your Savior. And for those of us who know you, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid of the weapons of the enemy. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.